Good morning, and welcome to everybody uh, for what I think promises to be both a very engaging and informative morning. I'm really excited to be here. My name is John Mayo. I'm a professor of economics, business, and public policy at the McDonough School of Business and a Klutz. Uh, I earned my academic stripes, I guess. Uh, uh, today, we're here to, uh, to talk about something that is very much, let's say, in the wheelhouse of the host organization, the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. The mission of the center is to advance discussion and dialogue and debate on issues that lie right at the nexus of business and public policy. Today, of course, what we're here to talk about is cyber, the issue of cybersecurity, which is very much on not only the minds of people here in Washington and around the country, but on the lips of, of people in this country. Uh, today, what I hope to do is to create a real value added in, in the morning discussion by, by offering one special dimension of this discussion, and that is to think very carefully about the market drivers to the adoption of the cybersecurity framework. Uh, very oftentimes, cybersecurity is thought of as really a technical problem with a technical fix. And certainly, there is a very, very important role for uh, technical uh, people and technical solutions. But this, if you think at all, even for a few moments, about the notion of how we are going to get to success, whatever success means in this space, you have to believe that it's going to require the voluntary or not so voluntary participation of a wide uh, sector or a wide variety of private sector actors in addition to uh, a lot of attention from the public sector. So thinking about this issue as one where uh, identifying incentives and institutions that promote cybersecurity is really, really very, very critical. So today what we're doing is having this discussion under the title, From Here to Secure Market Drivers in the, in the Cybersecurity Framework. Uh, by way of organization, what we're going to do is have first a keynote uh, speech by uh, Phyllis Schneck, who we're very, very pleased to have, who is Deputy Undersecretary of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, to offer some, some initial remarks and to field a few questions. Then we'll move to two panel discussions. Uh, the first is a panel discussion that will be from a uh, uh, set of panelists that are experts from the public sector. And then we'll have some Q&A and then move to a discussion from, the, uh, from a set of people, uh, pa of panelists from the private sector. And we're very excited about this. The idea is to have a robust discussion. So uh, while we have a set of people who are experts in their own right, they've been asked to uh, keep their remarks relatively limited so that we have time for questions and answers uh, to really promote this discussion. Um, as I said, everyone on the, uh, on the dais today uh, is distinguished, so distinguished that I'm not going to introduce them uh, other than to simply say that their bios are in your handouts. Uh, please look at that and, and with apologies to, to those people who I am not uh, uh, introducing properly, just do know that they are experts in their own right. Uh, with that, let me turn the podium over to Phyllis, who will kick off the, this morning's event. Good morning. I realize that. I want to first of all just start off by saying thank you very much for having me here, for having uh, the Department of Homeland Security here. Um, I want to thank John. Uh, thank you for what you do. The fact that you are focused here bright and early in the morning on thinking about cybersecurity shows us that it's no longer a technical problem of nerds, viruses, and worms in their basement. And we really look at how we secure our way of life. So by a little bit of background, uh, my own background is high performance computing and cryptography. It's also looking at public-private partnership, working with a lot of our law enforcement partners and really how we engage our private sector and academic stakeholders in how we actually look at this problem. Cybersecurity, you all drove here in a computer today or rode in one or walked on one. Uh, electronics are in everything we do. So my role in the Department of Homeland Security is in what we call the National Protection and Programs Directorate. It's, and it's focused on how we look at cybersecurity through 
our way of life, our transportation, our water, our oil and gas, everything that drives what we do, everything that powers what we do, and looking at how you make those systems resilient. So it's not just about the IT systems and the computers. It's about how you keep everything else we have awake, even if some natural disaster tries to hurt it, like a hurricane or a storm, even if something, an adversary, a witted adversary comes at it. How you keep those systems resilient. So our mission and part of our mission space in National Protection and Programs Directorate and what drives us is what we call critical infrastructure resiliency. So when I look at cybersecurity and the importance of our markets and the importance of our business and our academia, it's keeping that stuff alive. Other parts of my responsibility also include across the Department of Homeland Security. How do we engage across our department? How do we learn lessons from the folks that keep our own network safe? How do we leverage the enormous research and development efforts that we have? How do we contribute to more people like that are in this room that are learning about cybersecurity in our workforce? Uh, so as we look at that, one of my priorities, I've been in my job 12 weeks, by the way. I left a career in the private sector, uh, a place that I loved, but I left it because uh, this is an opportunity to really focus on the mission, 100% on what we want to get done without a quarterly reporting to get in the way. So with that opportunity, looking at our amazing teams, and I'm going to brag about the team a little bit, one of the things that my friends said to me when I came over is, is the joke you hear about government. And a lot of my good friends across the country said, what are you doing? You're no longer going to get to work with good people. Uh, I got news for them. I work with the finest people on the planet. And if I could just thank, you know, Bob Kolaski, Coleman Mehta, Davis Hake, and John Leslie, and the team back at, at the department that is supporting this mission, uh, this has been, in, even in just 12 weeks, one of the biggest learning experiences and humbling adventures I've ever had. Uh, so as we continue that, my top priority will be building trust with our stakeholders. Our academic stakeholders in research and development, our businesses throughout the country and throughout the world, cybersecurity is an international mission. And it'll be building that trust because we face an adversary that has no way of life to defend. They have no civil liberties, no privacy to worry about. They have no lawyers. They have plenty of money. They share information. No joke, we study this. They meet in the prisons. They do everything that we can't do. They have everything that we don't have as far as funding. And they're using our good infrastructure to get technical a little bit ship really bad stuff at carrier grade speed to really good people. And it unfortunately affects a lot more, more than computers. It affects our oil and gas, our water, and everything we consider critical and everything we consider in our way of life. So what we've had to do is look at, at how we drive better cybersecurity. This is the only country in the world where we can build a partnership like this. Talk to many governments about how you would partner between public and private to literally compare what we know to leverage the, the power of government to help bend rules, make rules, enable rules, enable things, to leverage the expertise in the private sector, to innovate, to build good science, to build fun things, to build that way of life, and to put them together. In many governments, the private sector works with the government because they have to or because it's honorable. In many governments, they work with, uh, in many other countries, the private sector works with the government because basically they'll get killed if they don't. Uh, but you look at different cultures, we are doing this because we can and because we want to and because our businesses can drive really good innovation at the same time as we are able to really take up many levels how we secure these systems. So when we look at the executive order and we look at the framework that NIST helped to build, a couple of key things about that. NIST engaged the private sector fully over the past <coughs> nine months. Companies sent the best minds they had to workshops. They spent two to three days looking at how you really look at cybersecurity. What are the parts of products companies could make? What are the best practices that we could honestly think that people will implement? What are the right ways that we can all go forward as business? And now we look at, and, and my world in the Department of Homeland Security, main goal is to get this adopted, but adopted right. As I told a group yesterday, um, a group of, of private sector stakeholders, you all knew me 12 weeks ago when I sat in your seat. My views haven't changed. I just have a different employer. I have a longer commute and no one's allowed to buy me a drink. But my views haven't changed. And my views are very much that cybersecurity is in our way of life and it has to be driven by business and innovation. This is not a, a ruse to get regulation. And what we need to do with that is make a conversation of how do you drive adoption of best practices that enables business to make more money, which really enables businesses to make more good science, good innovation, and good products. And how do we enable that so that there's a market for the performance goals, how we measure that, 
but not a compliance market. I firmly, strongly do not believe that compliance is security. Compliance is checking off a few boxes saying, I bought a widget and I did that. The adversary will know what widget you bought and he'll know what you did and 15 years later some other regulation will come out and change it. Meanwhile, you haven't put money into good science and good stuff or into your business. What we want to do is take the creativity that drives our business and put that into how you assess your risk. So you do it as a risk management approach. You take it up to the C-suite, so the chairman of the board who is responsible, whose head is on the line with the SEC and the shareholders for showing that they've identified the assets in the company and that they're protecting them. And one of the things against which we have to protect these days is an electronic event simply because electronics are in everything that we live, do, breathe, and eat. And one of the things that we want to look at is how you drive a market for that. So in the whole performance goal area, but not make it compliance, and I would look for this audience for some help there. How we can drive adoption, but forgive me, how we make that cool. And that means changing a culture. It doesn't mean some smart people put together a, a framework they think is smart and they're going to force it on people. It says, how does business adopt this so that more businesses are investing better in cybersecurity? Let me explain why that matters. There's no big company out there that I've talked to that needs a set of best practices in cybersecurity. They get it. But their customers, their suppliers, their state, local, municipal support, that's all in the small to medium category. Those guys are very vulnerable right now. They don't have the money to invest in cybersecurity, and partly because they haven't budgeted for it, and a lot of that reason is simply because they haven't known to. When we incorporate a company, a lot of us just think about what state are we going to incorporate in. So you think about Delaware versus California. You don't think about what are the assets I have to protect. A company of seven people right now could be making the next cancer cure or the next jet engine. And if they're not protecting it, that's a national security problem and that's profit loss. So it's a loss for us. The other piece we want to look at is not only helping the small to mediums protect their assets better, but also imagine the understanding that we don't have because they don't know the, the attack attempts that are coming into them. They're not getting reported, either electronically or even just sharing with their colleagues. We don't know, and remember that small to medium and state and local, that's 99% of what's connected right now in this country. We don't know what's happening to 99% of our stakeholders. We only know on the big guys. So imagine having a weather map where you only know the weather in one state and trying to protect against a tornado or forecast a big hurricane. We at DHS have the ability to work with privacy, with civil liberties concerns, and also collect what I'll call cybersecurity indicators on the level of volumes of bad stuff going where. We don't have that data for most of the market. If this framework could get adopted the right way, we could start to understand better who is attempting to get into those other companies and smaller places and protect everyone else a lot better. That's the one thing the adversary can't do in cyber. And that is what will destroy the profit model for right now those who engage in cyber crime uh, and cyber destruction. What we worry about most is a cyber event that causes a bad physical event. But only business can drive the adoption of a framework like this. And it's really just about how do you get small to medium business to look at what best practices are to invest in protecting what matters to them and also get them on the people level. You have a nerd here telling you this is a people problem, not a technology problem. How do you get people to share, well, I'll share information, you've probably heard that line too much, but it means exchange with what you know, with what someone else knows, even if they're a competitor, at the right time, so that you can understand the threat. And what we're looking at, and in sort of wrapping that up, is a very strong adoption of best practices. Not everyone would have to do it the same way, but really looking to the business community, looking to the venture capital community. Imagine if you couldn't get A round or B round if you hadn't proven uh, that you'd secured the assets. They insure everybody else. They insure the people. They insure the building. Why not insure the electronic leakage of information or further damage? So how do we engage the business community to help us better protect our cyber assets, which will better protect our critical infrastructure? That's what worries me. That's what worries the, the teams that I work at with. Uh, that's what worries a good part of our country right now. And that's what I would look for in partnership uh, especially internationally, if you look at if we can get this adoption up of good cyber practices, uh, it will drive business, not only in the markets that help assure the performance, uh, but it will drive business in leaving more money for the actual innovation of good science. It will enable our smart people to not have so much noise coming at them in cybersecurity, but be able to quietly hunt for the really bad stuff. 
and maybe even report it if we're lucky. It'll also help other countries adopt our framework and our practices. It'll enable some standards. DHS is actually looking at ways that exist right now. They've been adopted by the financial community to look at how you have machine to machine, just like we communicate in your email by a certain protocol and your web by a certain protocol, to be able to communicate machine to machine when they see a cyber threat. So literally making the journey that electronic traffic takes safer because if somewhere in the network it's discovered that it's a threat because somebody else saw it, because people, more people are looking, then that threat might not get to you. So what we're looking at as a department, as a government, as a community, is how we engage mass adoption of good cyber practices that does not promote regulation, but promotes business to drive the innovation, drive the market for how to measure it, help us build in good incentives practices, everything from reputational kind of work. If you saw the blog from Michael Daniel at the White House, it might be good for a company's reputation or brand to invest better in cybersecurity. Uh, down the road, we may be able to have cyber insurance. Look at money being built into grants. So if you get grant money, there's some money in there to protect the things you're going to build. Um, this is what we're asking, and we really need your help. This is a very big task. We need ways to get companies to almost change the business culture so that we can build some very simple practices in and invest early against a threat that I understand most people can't see. It's not a tangible or visible threat very often. But there are two kinds of companies, those who know they're compromised and those who don't. And basically, everybody has a visitor, and I tell you that professionally and scientifically. The question is how to mitigate that risk. You can't get everything. What are the best practices? We will put the full force of government behind enabling this in partnership with the private sector. Uh, I am fully committed to this. It's part of my job, and we will get it done. So I would ask for uh, any questions and how we can help you uh, help us help you. And uh, thank you very much. I hope I stayed on time with uh, enough time to give you some questions. Anything, yeah. was designed for the critical infrastructure, and the critical infrastructure is pretty much through the EO and the PPD 21 and EO 13636, they define what that critical infrastructure is. So it sounds like we're moving away from just using the framework for the critical infrastructure to everybody, the 99%. So is that the intent, or is the intent to further define what the critical infrastructure is have this framework apply to that critical infrastructure and have other programs like CDM and everything apply to quote unquote non-critical infrastructure or, or assets that are defined, not defined as critical infrastructure? It's a great question. So I think it's confusing and I think it's both. So there are companies that are in well-defined critical infrastructure in the 16 sectors, uh, but there's also uh, this notion of getting companies to take the level up a notch in this country as to what they invest in in cybersecurity. And many of our small to mediums, you think about municipal power companies, um, that's what I think about when I say that. Those are small to medium businesses uh, that are critical infrastructure. Or oil and gas companies or water. You'll find that a lot of that small to medium, and especially in the state and local, fits in all the state and local because their government fits into critical infrastructure. So while we're not trying to redefine anything, you'll find that a lot of that does fit. Now, the other side is, uh, from my view, and in, in the job I'm trying to get done for the good of the country, uh, we would like to see, number one, business help us drive this and create a way for it to be easier and better and inviting for all companies to invest in cybersecurity. And I don't mean spend a lot of money and buy fancy things. I mean drive a market where you identify what you have to protect and you buy the best thing. Hopefully it's not as expensive. Um, so I am looking to cover the most ground strategically but we're not looking to redefine what's critical or not. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about how um, the, thank you. Um, the cyber framework will help to increase international norms as the U.S. leads the way. Have you seen any cybersecurity standards or regulations in other countries that you think um, have sort of would be a good example for the U.S.? Okay, so I want to be careful. It's another great question. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to presume that we're going to set norms from this. Uh, what, we, what we have heard in discussions with other governments is, wow, that's interesting. 
we'd like to help, perhaps we can look at how we can adopt some of that. Um, other countries are also sharing uh, ideas with us. So international standards are a great way. For example, I mentioned the protocol to talk, uh, send cyber threat indicators. DHS has developed something we call sticks and taxi. That's railroad tracks and trains that are standard ways to ship cyber indicators across common roads with common uh, casings. Uh, and we hope to, to look at that as an, an in, uh, international way of doing things, whether it's those or someone else's, so that we can better communicate threat more quickly in the future. We will need international standards. Uh, what we're looking to do right now is, number one, help make companies safer, but help companies make companies safer, not regulatory make companies safer. Uh, and the other way is work with our international partners to make sure that we, we're all connected, right? U.S. companies have global assets. I come from one, right? Global companies have U.S. assets. Um, so I think the norms discussions will happen later on the policy side. Concern right now is how you get business to drive this so that it is in the interest of business and innovation. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I would like you to address, I don't know if there's a, how I would phrase a question, but I'd like you to address the IG report that just came out in terms of, of DHS and their systems. Uh, one of the major components of collaboration with the government in raising cybersecurity awareness and, and uh, assisting businesses to, to um, improve their security profile is, is a uh, feeling or a development of a trust relationship between the government and business. And I would like you to address how you feel that, uh, um, how we can get further along in development of that trust. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to start out by saying I will get your card and send you the full text of what uh, we would also like to see out there, the other side of that. Um, so first of all, our one of the first things I did when I came to DHS was look at the DHS network and meet our new uh, Chief Information Security Officer, who is phenomenal. Um, we all take a lot of pride in the work that they're doing. We are at the top of our FISMA compliance. Um, I, it is my understanding that that report uh, was written before certain things uh, were upgraded and happened. Uh, we're also looking down the line at how we actually implement, that's why I work so closely with the CISO now in my 12 weeks, how we take some of the programs that we're putting out uh, from National Protection and Programs Directorate and use those to protect federal networks, including DHS. We will be drinking our own champagne. Uh, one of those programs when we can do it, uh, and not all of the, the, the reason we haven't done it is, is not all DHS. There are a lot of moving parts to that, uh, but be able to protect that with our Einstein program the ability uh, to take a crowdsourced view of what's happening all across government and protect every single point with that. So we'll be adding that. We will be a first customer or a second or third customer for continuous diagnostics and mitigation, which turns your network, they're already doing some of this, into an ecosystem where every device on the network learns something. So it's like your body fighting a cold uh, instead of just threats coming in and you write it in a notebook. Uh, but a lot of work's been done on the DHS uh, network itself, and I'd like to give you the full report later, because we answered to, I believe, Congress about this a while back before that report was published, and I think there was a timing issue with that. I think it came out before, uh, just like legislation comes out and it prescribes things that were good a year ago, I think this report came out with some older information. That's my understanding as of 12 weeks, and I will get you a comprehensive explanation following. But we do take a lot of pride in our network, and, and that will be something we very much focus on. Yes. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and can you hold on for just one moment for the microphone? If um, one of the levers that, uh, one of the points of leverage with public companies obviously is the financial community. Do you engage with them at all as a way of uh, creating leverage with the companies that they uh, analyze and report on? Because that, that's one community CEOs listen to? Absolutely. So the financial community is probably the best example of how to partner. And as was explained to me many years ago by a gentleman that had worked in the financial community for probably 50 years, he said they started down on Wall Street in the dark of the tall buildings. They all went to the same delis. And all the bankers from the 30s on shared information. And this culture, because unlike the rest of us in other parts of the critical infrastructure like energy or water, Criminals always went for the money. So the financial community always knew they had assets to protect. So they knew how to combine their information. They always worked with government. They always worked with each other. It transcended competition. 
they have been very closely working with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I'll give a plug for the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which is a large group of financial companies that actually have created a nonprofit. Other sectors have this as well, where they all get together transcending competition and share cyber threats. They are also early adopters of our machine-to-machine -machine light speed protocol of a machine sending notice of a cyber threat to another machine far faster than you or I could communicate it. Um, so they are uh, probably our biggest champions and we really appreciate the work of the financial <coughs> sector. Okay, please help me thank Phyllis Schneck.